Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Regina Yao, founder and president of the Pixel Project, and I'm moderating the fifth YouTube session of the sixth fall edition of our Read for Pixels campaign. So through Read for Pixels, the Pixel Project is collaborating with 14 award-winning best-selling authors to raise awareness about violence against women and to raise funds for the Pixel Project to keep our efforts to end violence against women alive and kicking. So we'll be telling you more about the Read for Pixels fundraiser, which has lots and lots of exclusive author goodies a little later in this session. And you can find out more about the Pixel project and learn more about Balance Against Women, especially if you're new to this, um, by going to www.thepixelproject.net. Now, we have a very special guest for today's live Read for Pixels discussion and Q&A session. It's New York Times bestseller and award-winning author, Christine Catherine Rush. Now, Ms. Rush, Chris, Chris, uses several pen names, including Chris Nelscott for Mystery and the first and so far only female editor. She's also the first and so far only female editor of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. She has written about women's issues for more than 30 years and her two most popular science fiction series, The Diving Universe and The Retrieval Artist are under option for television. Her Chris Nelscott Smokey Dalton series is in development for May for a major motion picture. You can find out more if you go to her website. Uh, Chris, what's your website? It's chriswrites.com. That's K-R-I-S rights.com. Yeah. And um, Chris has also generously donated four special giveaways to the stash of author goodies that we have up as treats for donors at the Read for Pixels Rally Up fundraising page. And we'll show you where to go at the end of the session. Um, and uh, for US donors only, so if you are in the United States, uh, Chris has two book bundles. One is the Chris Nelscott hardcover book bundle. Now this is a hardcover uh, first edition book bundle. It's uh, there's one signed and personalized copy of Protectors and one signed and personalized copy of Stone Cribs, which is the first. And is it the first in the uh, Smokey Dalton series, Chris? The no, Stone it's actually uh, it, there's a character in Protectors named Valentina Wilson, and it's the first mm -hmm. appearance of her. Each uh, Chris Nelscott Smokey Dalton book stands alone, so that's a Smokey Dalton book, and it's got Val in it. And then there's Protectors, which also has Val in it. Yeah, so the both books, Protectors and Stone Crypts, are linked together by Val. Yeah, um, and uh, the second giveaway is a Christine Catherine Rush Science Fiction Fantasy Starter Paper Book Bundle, Paperback Book Bundle, and he has The Disappeared, which is book one of the Retrieval Artist series, uh, Diving into the Wreck, which is book one of the Diving series, and The Sacrifice, which is book one of the Face series. So a wide range of genres there. But that book bundle has been taken up, it has been snapped up by Yankton Robbins from California. So thank you so much, Yankton, uh, for thank your you. donation. Um, we'll be with you, uh, Chris will, be, will send you the books shortly. Um, and, um, we, and if you are worldwide, if you're not in the US, um, there are two uh, book bundles too, but these are ebook bundles. So there's an ebook bundle version of the Protectors and Stone Crypts, that's bundle number one, and ebook bundle version of the Christine Catherine Rush Science Fiction and Fantasy Starter uh, for you, if you haven't read any of Chris's books. Um, it's the same books as the uh, paperback book bundle. Uh, so it's book one in, of her retrieval series, book one of her, the diving series, and book one of the phase series. Now, um, just to make a note, uh, normally you might think that eBooks are DRM protected and you know, if something goes wrong with the provi uh, eBook provider that you won't have your eBooks anymore. No, Chris has very generously ensured that when you get your eBook files, the ebook files stay with you. You will get the actual file so you can read it forever and ever and ever, and it's yours. So please make your way over to our donation page. Um, the donation page is here. We'll just type that in right now if you are champing at the bit to get to it. Mm hmm. 
And there you go. All right. So there's only one of each bundle, by the way, if, if anyone is wondering. So if you want the bundle, go and pick it up right now. Make the donation requested and pick it up right now. Um, and please give generously because all funds go to it's the Pixel Project's work to help end violence against women. So including programs like Read for Pixels, where we chat with authors like Chris about stopping violence against women and violence against women in pop culture. And these are all archives. So if you're a teacher, you're a librarian, you're a coach, um, you're a mentor, and you need some tools to get to start talking about violence against women with your community, with your kids, with your students. This is what this series is all about. Now we've raised $755 so far towards the $5,000 goal. So again, please give generously um, so we reach, reach our goal by October 15th. Now, if you're watching this session on YouTube, you'll also be able to ask Chris questions live, like right now. Just make sure you're logged into your YouTube account so that you can type your questions into the chat box to the right of the YouTube screen. And Xiao Chen, who is today's producer and chat box moderator, will relay them to me to read out to Chris to answer. So get busy with your questions. Chris will answer anything about everything from her books to publishing, to writing, uh, to uh, her work in uh, women's rights. So. Any questions, get them fired up. Now, we'll go over to Chris now, because welcome to Read for Pixels, Chris. Um, what will you be reading for us today? I'm going to be reading a section of Protectors, uh, which is a book that I wrote about three women in 1968. Um, and so I'm going to be reading actually out of the middle of the book because I wanted to read a passage that is relevant to what we're talking about today. And so I'm going to give you a little background beforehand. Would you like me to do that now, Regina? Yes, please. Okay. So I'm going to read my introduction so I don't forget anything. Um, and then I will read the chapter for you guys. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from the middle of Protectors, Protectors, which I wrote under my Chris Nelscott pen name, is set in 1968, before women's shelters became common in the US, before anyone thought of a rape crisis center, and before the women's self-defense movement started. This chapter features two of the principal characters of the novel, Pammy, who opened a gym, and Eagle, a former military nurse who served in Vietnam. Because the gym caters only to women, Pammy has found herself dealing with abused women more than she wants to. Eagle, who is worried that the city might use the slightest thing to shut the gym down, helps out in any medical emergency. There are three other characters in this chapter. Strawberry, a University of California Berkeley college student and a hippie who hangs out at the gym. Stella, the wife of one of the California regents who has brought, a batter, who has brought battered women to Pammy before for help. And Norma, the woman that Stella brought this time. Norma is married to a world famous musician and has fled after her husband turned on her and her baby daughter, Raquel. The action takes place late one night after the Closed. Pammy convinced Norma to let Eagle examine her. Strawberry is watching the baby. The book has rotating viewpoints, and this chapter is entirely from Eagle's point of view. So here we go. Eagle wished she had a Polaroid. She wanted to take photographs of every inch of Norma's body. The woman was covered in bruises, old bruises, new bruises, fading bruises, and bruises just emerging. Her husband was a sadist an effective one. He liked administering pain, but he knew when to stop. He took Norma to the verge of needing emergency medical attention, but never did enough damage to make it inevitable. He gave his wife injuries that she could live with. Eagle did not shudder. She had seen this too many times in a variety of different ways. She'd seen it more than she wanted to here at the gym, although not this effectively. She'd seen this kind of damage in Pleiku, in one of the Vietnamese, in some of the Vietnamese, particularly the guides the men no longer trusted. There was one officer who had taken torture to an art form, knowing how to inflict the maximum amount of pain for a minimum amount of damage. It looked like Norma's husband had learned that skill somewhere too. Eagle didn't mention this to Norma. Norma had been reluctant to show her injuries to Eagle, even though Eagle had insisted. Norma never entirely undressed. 
She took off some of the articles of clothing as Eagle needed to examine different parts of the body, but left other articles of clothing on. Eagle had had to cajole to see every inch of Norma, but somehow she had managed. The worst damage she had found was on Norma's face. Her husband had broken her nose, and judging by the feel of it, he had done so before. Eagle taped it up despite Norma's protest, being exceedingly careful with Norma's left cheek as she did so. X-rays would tell Eagle if the cheekbone was damaged because her fingers couldn't probe cautiously enough. After the work on the nose, Norma kept moving away. The pain was too much. But a damaged cheekbone wasn't life-threatening, and it became clear to Eagle clear that Eagle couldn't get Norma to a doctor unless her injuries threatened her life. The locker room smelled of damp tile, wet towels, and industrial strength cleaners. Pammy had managed to clean it up enough to make it presentable for the morning's classes, but it still had a dinginess that seemed unique to heavily used locker rooms everywhere. The nest of towels that once held the baby remained on the bench. Norma kept looking at that nest as if it had given her inspiration, or maybe strength because God knew this woman needed strength. She had stayed with her sadist much too long. Her torso, torso was an abstract painting of bruises, bruises upon bruises upon bruises. She had winced as Eagle pushed on them, feeling for swelling underneath the skin, especially around the stomach and the vital organs. Eagle hadn't found anything on the torso except the badly healed unevenness of a broken rib. Norma's buttocks and thighs had taken the most serious beating. It looked like the rat bastard had kicked her repeatedly in the lower back. Two bruises shaped like footprints crisscrossed over the back of her right thigh, and that was where her limp originated. Eagle had worried about that injury. If the bone was fractured, Norma would probably be all right. But if it was broken, its sharp edges could jab an artery. Eagle had already told Norma that she needed to get an x-ray on the leg, and Norma had said no. He'll find me at the hospital, she said, and that was true enough. Now she hovered over her clothing, as if putting it on again would hurt. She glanced at the showers. Do you mind if I take a shower, she asked. I haven't all day. I don't think it would be a problem. Eagle stood. Just avoid the tape on your nose, like I told you. Don't get it wet yet. Okay. Norma didn't sound daunted by that. Maybe she'd had her nose taped before. I'll get a towel for you, Eagle said, and be right back. Pammy kept a few towels in the janitor's closet for the women who had forgotten theirs. Eagle would fetch one from there. As she left the locker room, she grabbed her bag and carried it with her. She knew better than to leave a bag of any kind with any kind of knife or small drugs that she occasionally used, alone with anyone. Stella was leaning against the counter, reading something. She raised her head as Eagle emerged. Well? Stella asked. In a minute. Eagle opened the janitor's closet near the kitchen, grabbed the thickest, softest towel she could find, and carried it back inside the locker room. Norma was behind the shower curtain, the rest of her clothes neatly folded on a chair. I'm setting the towel on the edge of the bench, Eagle said. Thank you. Norma's voice sounded normal, as if she hadn't been through severe trauma at all. The woman had clearly been abused for a long time. She knew all the tricks to hide the damage her husband had done. Eagle had tried to talk to her about the marriage, but Norma wouldn't say a word about it. She only told the story of the baby's injury and how hard she fought to get the child away from him. The look in his eye, he had said, she had said, her voice trailing off. The look in his eye. She had come back to that statement more than once. Apparently, the look in her husband's eye had finally awakened her to what she had subjected herself to. Or maybe he had trained that eye on the child, and that had frightened her. Although Eagle had asked for clarifications, Norma had given her none. And really, it wasn't Eagle's business. Eagle's business was to figure out the extent of the injuries, and she had done that as best she could, without access to an x-ray machine or more sophisticated equipment. She let herself out of the locker room to find Pammy standing beside Stella, waiting. Eagle had expected Strawberry, too, but apparently Strawberry remained in the kitchen with the baby. The hippy-dippy dingling had proved herself to be pretty solid. Despite her misgivings, Eagle was impressed. Well... Pammy asked. Norma needs to see a doctor, Eagle said. There's an injury on her right leg that I'm pretty worried about. Her nose is broken, and I'm not sure about her left cheekbone. Should I take her to the emergency room, Stella asked. Even if you wanted to, she won't go, Eagle said, and it can wait. She needs to see someone, though, and I recommend that that someone isn't in the Bay Area. That husband of hers enjoys hurting her. Looks like he's been doing it for years. 
Pammy glanced at the locker room door. Eagle recognized the expression. She was worried that Norma would come out to find them discussing her. She's taking a shower, Eagle said. I think this is the first shower she's had in a while where she didn't need to keep the baby close or keep an eye out for her husband. Pammy nodded. Stella was frowning. I don't know where to take her. Her family doesn't want to be involved, but they might. You've got a smart husband here, Eagle said. He's gotten away with this for a long time. He'll want her back. Even if the family wants to be involved, they're out of the question. Stella sighed. You're right. Pammy didn't volunteer anything. She was quiet, which wasn't like her. Eagle looked at her, afraid Pammy would ask Eagle to take Norma out of the Bay Area. Eagle had taken an injured woman out of the Bay Area for Pammy once before. That woman had fought back hard when her husband attacked her. He had badly Im injured her, and Eagle had taken her to a hospital in Bakersfield, which was almost too far away. Eagle had stayed until that woman pulled through and then helped her get out of town. But that woman had had her own stash of money saved up and had been planning her escape for years. Eagle had a hunch that Norma's departure was a spur of the moment thing, a runaway now impulse that she wouldn't have imagined doing a week earlier. It made Norma's escape less likely to succeed. It also meant she probably had few friends, no resources, and no idea how to survive on her own. Thank you, Eagle, Pammy said softly. It sounded like a dismissal. Eagle tilted her head. She hadn't expected that. You have a plan? Eagle asked. Yeah, Pammy said. We have some options. Stella looked at Pammy in surprise. Clearly, Stella hadn't been apprised of the options either. Did that mean Pammy and Norma had come up with something? Or Pammy and Strawberry? That last thought made Eagle deeply uncomfortable. She wasn't exactly sure why. At that moment, the locker room door opened and Norma emerged. Her wet hair hung over her shirt and her bruises looked bright. The swelling on her face seemed even more pr pronounced. The tape did not look wet, however. Norma had listened to that instruction, at least. Where's Raquel? She asked. In the kitchen with strawberry, Pammy said. Norma bit her lower lip, then glanced at the plate glass window. The reflections of all four women looked blurry in the glass. Someone could see them, maybe not identify them, but see them. Where do we sleep? She asked. We need to discuss that, Pammy said. What about the usual spot? Stella asked. Generally, they placed women in the locker room with a foam pad and sleeping bags. The room was safe and closed and windowless. No one on the outside could see any light filtering under the door. Could you set it up? Pammy asked Stella. Stella glanced at Eagle, surprised. Eagle understood, though. Pammy wanted to talk to Strawberry and Norma alone. You need me for anything else? Eagle asked. She didn't want to get roped into driving Norma somewhere. Somewhere, Unlike the woman a few months ago, Norma could change her mind at any second, putting her driver at risk. Pammy opened her mouth, then closed it, as if rethinking her initial response. She glanced at Norma. Do you have any questions for Eagle? She asked. Norma didn't meet Eagle's gaze. That behavior was pretty common after something this traumatic. No, Norma said, then added in a near whisper, thank you. You're welcome. Eagle grabbed her bag and headed toward the kitchen. She was going out back, no matter what Pammy said. I'll talk to you tomorrow, Pamela. Thank you for coming on such short notice. Pammy sounded as formal as Eagle had. She didn't follow, probably waiting for Eagle to leave before talking plans. Eagle straightened her shoulders as she walked. All those years, and she still had trouble shaking off some patients. Norma was one, mostly because Eagle had a hunch nothing she said would make any difference at all. This woman would go back to her husband, get punched until something vital gave way, and then she would die, leaving her child alone with a monster. Eagle pushed open the kitchen door. Strawberry was sitting on a chair at the table, her finger clutched in the baby's tiny hand. The baby had fallen asleep that way. You volunteered? Eagle asked before thinking about it. Yeah, Strawberry said. I can get her out of the city. You know she's just going to come back, right? You know this will end badly, Eagle said. I don't know that, Strawberry said, and neither do you. Her voice shook just a little. She suspected things could go awry. The kids got your heart already, Eagle said. They always grab on as tight as she's holding your finger right now. But that kid's not yours. I know, Strawberry said. You don't know, Eagle said, not deep down. Strawberry started to speak, but Eagle held up her free hand. You listen for a minute, Eagle said, because I'm thinking of you. If you're taking them somewhere, then take them there. Get them set up. 
and leave. Don't ask for updates. Don't ask to be informed if they're coming back. Don't volunteer your address or your phone number. You let that woman do whatever she's going to do, and you don't interfere. Strawberry moved the baby's hand slightly. You don't have a lot of faith in her. I'm not worried about her, Eagle said. I'm worried about you. Strawberry looked up, clearly surprised. Other people's crap is heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking, and you're volunteering in the worst kind of situation. If you're not careful, it'll take you down. A lump rose in Eagle's throat. She swallowed. The lump moved down just a little. Is that what happened to you? Strawberry asked. Eagle wasn't sure what the question meant. Maybe Strawberry was asking her about her cynicism, maybe her rudeness, maybe her personality. Eagle wasn't going to ask for a clarification. They teach you when you become a nurse to let the patients go. You can't make them eat right. You can't make them follow the medical protocols. You can't even make them come back if they break a wound open and start bleeding again. Your job ends at the door because it has to. Do you understand? Eagle, Strawberry's eyes were big. Yes. She didn't understand. No one could understand. Hell, Eagle had had two years of domestic experience before heading to Saigon, and she hadn't understood. She'd looked up too many of them, asked too many of them to report. They'd stolen her heart, some of them, and now she would never get it back. You won't listen, Eagle said as she walked around the table. She didn't look at that baby again. She had deliberately not called the baby by her name. Eagle didn't even want to think about the footy pajamas, the bruise on the shoulder, those big blue eyes. She didn't want to think about them, and she wouldn't, not after she went out the door. I hear you, Strawberry said. Yeah, you hear me, Eagle said, but you don't listen. No one does on their first one, but you'll remember this conversation, believe me. Strawberry watched her. Answer me one question. Eagle hadn't expected that. She'd expected some more denials, not that strong voice. What? Eagle asked. Strawberry moved the baby's hand again. If you think this is going to fail, why do it? Good question. There was no easy answer. Because, Eagle said, that lump threatening again, every once in a great while, somebody proves me wrong. That's the end. Um, so this is what you've just read. Um, if you just joined us, everybody, we are here with uh, Christine Catherine Rush, and we Chris has just finished reading a very, very harrowing passage because this is actually what happens to a lot of women. And today, this is what we're going to be talking about, amongst other things. Uh, so thank you for being here with us, Chris. Uh, Let's go to the first question. And we are starting to get questions from the audience as well. So we'll intersperse questions, uh, inters intersperse discussion questions with questions from the audience. So keep them rolling in audience. If you just joined us, welcome. And uh, if you have any questions to ask Chris about books, writing, publishing, pop culture, drop them into the YouTube uh, chat box to the right of the screen. You have to be logged in to be able to do that. But once you do that, ask away and Chris will answer as many as you can. So Chris, you write in a wide range of genres. Yes. But regardless of genre, your female characters, including Val, Egon, and Pammy, and Protectors, which you just read from, and Noel de Ritchie in the Retrieval Artist series. Um, they are all complex, motivated people with distinct personalities. They range from women who are confident and dominant to those who are damaged and determined, as well as women whose personalities and attitudes evolve as their story progresses. So what or who are your inspirations for your female characters? I like to write about characters who are real to me. And so, you know, I just kind of consider myself an observer of, of human beings. And um, occasionally I can see a direct link from one character to uh, a person I know, but very rarely it's usually a combination or it's somebody who's similar to what I've known or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there are a lot of strong women in my life. There've been a lot of difficult women in my life. Um, and so, uh, and I'm both, I'm strong and difficult. So, um, you know, sometimes they're based, well, every character, no matter what a writer tells you, every character is based on them, the good, the bad, 
They're all based on the writer. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the inspiration for me is just the people I see. Yeah, and you know, we were chatting about this before that the you know the the sort of the moniker of difficult is def pretty much defined by other people, especially men who call us difficult when we don't do what they want us to do. So difficult is I think difficult is sometimes it's not as objective a description of a person as we as people would like it to be too. I think that's true. I also do think that there are people who are a challenge to know, um, you know, because they are so uniquely themselves. And a lot of people go through the world and they're not uniquely themselves. They accommodate or, and men too, you know, um, they go through and they, they do what other, they think other people want and they're not speaking their mind. They're not truthful. They're not blunt. Um, when I call myself difficult, I'm, I can very well be because I speak my mind and I know there are a lot of people who don't like that. Um, and so they, they go back away from me. Um, and, uh, I used to think that, uh, people reacted that way to me because that's who I am. Um, that I speak my mind. It took me perhaps a decade, maybe more, to realize that there was two things going on. It was me speaking my mind, and, and people don't like that, but it was also me speaking my mind and me being female. Um, and it took me a long time to separate that out and went, oh, you know, there are times that I get this reaction just because I'm female, um, not because uh, in, in another circumstance, a man speaking his mind in that way, he would not be getting pushback the way that I am. It, it it's hard to separate out. So I just kind of, you know, say I am who I am, live with it um, and deal with it. Hmm. And, you know, every genre has its share of female stereotypes and tropes, you know, and um, how do you work around with subvert such stereotypes to create female characters of agency in dealing with the world around them? I mean, we've just had that passage, you, that excerpt that you read with uh, Eagle and Strawberry and Pammy, each of them dealing with Norma's situation in different ways, in their own way. Um, and, you know, how how do you subvert these stereotypes? Because none of them are stereotyped. They seem on the surface to be stereotypes, but as we saw, Strawberry even surprised Eagle when she asked a question at the end. Yes. Um, well, some of it I do, especially in uh, Protectors and the Chris Nell Scott books, I do it a lot by alternating points of view um, in Protectors. The uh, Smokey Dalton is a strict point of view, Smokey's point of view. But uh, in uh, The Retrieval Artist, I also switch points of view um, because I learned early on as a writer, and I think I learned it from Elizabeth Lynn, the fantasy writer, but nobody thinks of themselves as a villain, even if they are a villain, even if they're a horrible human being, they think they're fine. Um, they may know that they do some things that are not popular or people don't like it, but they always have a good reason for it. And so if you switch point of view, if you go from Eagle's point of view, say to Pammy's point of view, to Val's point of view, Val's not in here, but to Strawberry's, uh, you find out that they think of themselves completely differently. Um, Eagle is a particularly judgmental character because she's very hard on herself. And so, you know, she judges people by appearances right away. And she's making decisions mostly to keep them away from her. She wants to be alone. And, she, you know, she hates learning that people have other sides to them. Earlier in the book, just before the sequence, she has a big fight with Strawberry about, you know, she thinks Strawberry is kind of dumb and you know not doesn't belong and she should get out of the gym and um she's slowly realizing in this passage that strawberry has the same kind of heart she does and then she becomes worried about it because that's ultimately once you get past that barrier with eagle you realize uh oh you know she's got a really soft heart and she's just protecting that soft heart by being a little bit mean hmm. and you know in creating characters that you talk about switching points of view in order to show how well-rounded the characters are and all their different facets. Now, uh, sometimes when authors try to break these gender stereotypes and gender norms, they either fall into the not like other girls trope, which ends up feeling two-dimensional or gimmicky, or they go to the opposite extreme 
by trying to make the female character be everything to everyone. So when writing female characters, do you ever feel pressured by gender and cultural stereotypes to make them physically and emotionally likable and relatable? And do you ever get any flack for not making a female character likable enough? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I never think of my female characters as different from my male characters. Um, I just write characters. Um, and it, to me, they're people. So when I'm writing it, they surprise me. They do other stuff that I don't expect. They learn, they grow. Um, and yeah, occasionally with some of the female characters, especially early on in my career, I would get pushback. Um, the editor, the male editor, the first one I had on the diving series, I had sold the first diving novella to Sheila Williams at Asimov's. And then I did the, uh, put it together in Diving Into the Wreck in, in the book. And the male editor on that project told me that, you know, Boss, the main character who really, she doesn't really have a name because she doesn't tell people what her name is. He said, she's not that likable. And I'm like, she is who she is. And she says, uh, you know, people don't like her. They can just not be around her. Um, that's why she does the job she does, which is diving into wrecks out in space, mostly by herself. She doesn't care. And um, he said, maybe you should make her a little more likable. And I said, no. And uh, we left it at that. <laughs> I didn't make her more likable. I just continued to write about her. I like her a lot. But, you know, other people's reactions sometimes tell a lot more about them than it does about me or what I write. Yeah, and we, we usually, we started asking this question during Reef of Pickles interviews because, um, interestingly, there's a divide, there's a gender divide going down the middle. Male authors don't seem to get pushback when they write unlikable female characters, but female authors have mentioned, quite a few female authors have mentioned, yeah, I do get pushback when I write female characters who are unlikable. So it is interesting to uh, see to uh, see that gender divide. Now, speaking of novellas, there's a question from the audience from Misty306. She said, recently I attended a writer's conference. There I was told to submit my short stories and novellas before I submit a novel. Which journals or magazines do you recommend for submission? Okay, well, first let's back up to the piece of advice you got. Um, submit it all. You know, there are no rules that you have to submit short stories and novellas before you submit a novel. Life is short, you know, build your career. I sold eight novels before the first one was published. And I know that people said, you should only wait until the one's published. Don't listen to that kind of advice. It limits you. So um, now that I've said that, let's go to the short stories and novellas. If you like reading short stories and novellas, then write them. If you don't like reading them, don't do it. I'm assuming since you use the word my short stories and novellas, you're already writing them. Um, and I, you didn't tell me what genre you write in. Right now we live in like the golden age of short fiction. You can actually make a living selling to traditional short fiction markets if you're really, really good. You couldn't do that when I first started. Um, and so you can, you can find it, but you need to be reading it. I would recommend that you pick up all the best ofs, like the uh, best American fantasy stories, the best American mystery stories, the best American short stories, if you're here in the States. I know there are other volumes, like in England and other places. Pick those up. In the back of those books, they tell you where they got the stories from. Um, and you should then go to the website for those markets and make sure that they pay you because you are a writer and writers should be paid. Um, there are an awful lot of non-paying markets. And in fact, there are markets that make you pay them in order to get you know, your story even read. Stay away from those. You don't wanna go to those. So um, then you just, you start going through the list um, of the ones that are in the back of these books and you can figure it out. There's also some places online like Raylan, R-A-L-R-A, lan.com and places like that that list markets on books and uh, and novellas and stories i'm gonna cough <coughs> excuse me um it's allergy season around here so anyway um i would do all of that and you know mail them keep keep them in the mail do not keep an eye on just one 
Make sure you have more than one thing in the mail so that you're not obsessing about the one thing. And keep writing and keep producing and keep it in the mail. One more okay. cough. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm very sorry. All right, Miss. Good luck with your submissions. Um, so let's go back to the discussion. I think I have an echo here, so apologies for that. But um, sometimes my mic seems to be echoing during this session. Um, so let's go back to the discussion now. Let's talk genre. So the genres that you write include science fiction and fantasy and mystery and thrillers. And you also write romance. Mm -hmm. But let's look at science fiction and mystery and thrillers because they generally have violence and sexism built into many of their tropes and stereotypes. For example, there's the issue of fridging in fantasy and science fiction and comic books. And mystery thriller and thrillers often use the, you know, the woman as murder victim trope to kick off a story. So let's look at violence and toxic masculinity. The first question is, how do you find the balance between showing the violence as an integral part of the story and giving the reader a realistic depiction of violence without being gratuitous? That's a really good question, and it's one I struggle with. Um, it depends on the kind of story I'm telling. Uh, there are certain stories, for example, I write romance, and you know, occasionally I deal with the fact that there's violence in the world in the romance, and I just skate right over it. I just kind of talk about it in general. Um, I just finished writing a romance where I had to deal a lot with uh, children who were homeless and on the street. And I mentioned it in passing because people read romance as true escape. They have terrible lives. I know a lot of romance readers who are like doctors and nurses and um, people who are working as first responders. And so they're reading their romance so that they don't see the real world. And so I keep, I just scan right over it. If I'm writing a cozy mystery, which is the same sort of thing, where I call those, you know, bloodless stories where there's a body in the library and you try to figure out, you know, was he murdered with a pen in his ear? I don't know. Um, you know, then you don't describe, you don't describe any blood. I mean, even if the guy is hacked to death with an ax, you don't describe it. Um, you just have the, a little bit of blood in the corner and you have the ax over there. So you don't have to know some of the genre conventions. You also have to know what you're doing with uh, readers. I mean, there are certain times where it's really necessary to describe what's going on. For example, in the passage I just read about from Protectors, you needed to know what happened to Norma because this is important. It's upsetting to all the women. Eagle's pretending it really isn't upsetting to her, but it is. It's upsetting. Strawberry, Pammy's dealing with it. Stella's kind of scared. Um, and Norma, that's, that's her life. And so I needed to describe that in depth. Now, if I was you know, showing the scene of the husband hurting her, which I wouldn't do, it wasn't essential to the novel, but let's, assume, let's pretend it was, I wouldn't describe it horribly in depth because then we start getting into violence porn. I'm not gonna do that. Um, so you need to know that if you take it from the story and it doesn't add to the character, then you're doing violence porn. Um, if you're doing it and you're doing it because it's essential to understanding what's going on with the character and it's essential to know um, what, what's happening for the sake of the reader, then you can, um, you can do it. I tend to write more about the aftermath of violence than I do write about violence. Um, because I think the aftermath of violence is where we fall down as a culture. We kind of close our eyes and keep going. And instead we need to be helping people who have survived something and, you know, look at the trauma and help them get through that trauma. We're starting to get better, but we're not there yet. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's what a lot of other authors who we've had on talked about. Um, they said the same thing you did. They said a lot of fiction don't look, don't deal with the consequences of violence. And that is exactly what it needs, fiction needs to deal with now. If you're talking about anything from rape to domestic violence, you have to deal with it. And um, there are one interesting piece of um, discussion that we've had before that came up um, is when we had Steven Erickson on and his fans were quite going on about, well, this female character, why do you write this female character? She's so unlikable. And he actually said to them, he said, um, has it ever occurred to you guys, you all, that she had just, she had been sexually assaulted very badly, very, very violently. 
And the reason why she's behaving like this is because she is dealing with the trauma, with the PTSD. And dealing with trauma and PTSD and the aftermath, it's never pretty, it's never, it, it's, it's messy, it's, it's never, it doesn't fit into boxes. And women have no obligation to be nice and to be likable while they're dealing with trauma. Nobody has an obligation to be nice and likable while they're dealing with trauma because it's enough. And um, when the when his readers heard him say that, it kind of changed their point of view because they did not realize that, oh, yeah, okay. You know, that, that, that makes sense. But I think maybe it's, I, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe that speaks to the fact that a lot of, fiction, genre fiction, you don't deal with the aftermath of trauma. So people kind of get taken away. They don't know how to deal with it when they actually come across a book or a novella or a story that deals with it. Yeah, they don't know what, what it's all about. They, they're, it, there's a lot of stuff that goes on, particularly in thrillers, particularly in movies and television, that you know the 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 dead person, male or female, but um, usually it's female, is just a device to get the story moving, um, and that's not my kind of storytelling. Um, I want to know what happened to the family. I want to know what happened to the poor person. I mean, I hear about all these tragedies that happen in our world, real world and real life. And I'm like, oh, these poor people. I mean, the echoes through the community and the history and all the way through the generations, it doesn't stop. And that's what interests me as a writer. Um, he was exactly right when he was talking about, we don't, as people who are victims of crimes or people who've lived in difficult circumstances, we don't have to um, apologize for what we've done. Um, and we don't have to apologize and be something for somebody else just because we make them uncomfortable. Um, he's, he's right about that. I thought when I was trying to figure out what I was going to read, because I, I had told you initially when we talked about doing this, I was going to read from Protectors. Um, I initially thought of reading the opening, but the opening is uh, Eagle seeing a girl get kidnapped, which is part of you know what's going on with the whole book. It's not just women, it's also men in this book. But later in the book, we run across, Val runs across a girl who, and she is a girl, she's a college girl, who went through something horribly traumatic and has locked herself in her dorm room, essentially, going out only for classes and coming back. Um, I'm going to give you a spoiler. Um, at the end of the book, she comes to the gym to learn how to have self-defense. That's part of the theme of this whole book. But um, I looked at that chapter. First of all, it was long. But secondly, you know, it was too tied into the plot of the book for you to understand what was exactly going on. What I liked about using that chapter for, for here and what I kind of hoped I could use and I couldn't is the fact that this poor girl is trying to cope all by herself. It's 1968, there are no resources. Her family has thrown her out. Her friends don't know what happened. And you know she had this horrid traumatic experience. So she just locks herself in a room, does her studies and keeps going. She's not a nice person in quotes. She's not somebody who cares about other people's feelings. I'm not, at a certain point in the book, she doesn't even bathe anymore um, because she's just trying to deal with her own crisis. And you know, what I really care about as an author in my science fiction, my romance, and my, my mystery is watching people heal and getting over these, these traumas as best they can. Some things you just don't get over, but you learn how to live with. And um, that's as kind of, in many ways, the theme of protectors. Yeah. And, you know, um, both science fiction and mystery thriller genres are also well known for their male-dominated casts. I mean, um, talking about mystery and crime uh, stories, uh, Brandon Sanderson actually pointed out that certain um, types of crime stories like heists seem to all be populated by all male teens, with maybe a token female. Um, so, however, in the past quarter of a century, many authors have been pushing back by writing stories and characters that strongly repudiate toxic masculinity and all male casts. Uh, do you think this pushback 
it's just a trend or if it's a bellwether of the changes in society that are happening as cultures worldwide start dealing with the damage that absolute male privilege had done to the world? Ooh, there's a lot in that question. Um, I'm going to have you come back to the second part of that question after mm -hmm. I do the first part, um, yeah. because I actually disagree with Brandon. Um, mm -hmm. There is a lot, and throughout the history of fiction, there's a mm -hmm. lot of women teams, there's a lot of books about women, there's a lot of women, as particularly in mystery, who write about women and have done so since the, the beginning of the 20th century, at least, because that's where my knowledge goes back to. The problem is, is that the curators, the people who put together the best ofs, the people who put together um, the, you know, the, the books, the greatest books, 100 greatest books of the century and stuff like that, they pick men books um, with all men. And they forget you know, that the best-selling mystery writer of all time, all time, is a woman. It's Agatha Christie. Um, and you know, she has difficult women and difficult men, and she does all this stuff. And there, you know, there are books that you can go back all the way back to the 1930s and find all female heist crews. You can find all that stuff. It's just not reprinted enough. It's starting to be done in mystery in particular. Um, I did a book called Women of Futures Past about science fiction, trying to reclaim our history because women have been a part of science fiction from the beginning. Um, the uh, Amazing Stories had a female co-editor um, that who got lost in time. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these stories are about women um, and about strong women. If you read Anne McCaffrey publishing stuff in the 60s, her women are strong. Ursula Le Guin, her women are strong. It's been there. Um, it's just not something that's get discussed. And there's this thing that women have, it's only been the last 10 years or the last 25 years. That's not true. I was reading about strong women when I was a little girl. And um, they gave me hope. They gave me a way out. They showed me that the future is female centric and strong. And, um, you know, we just have lost it in the culture. And, you know, I, I think the problem is that the people we've been listening to, the people who are in charge of the lists and everything else, they only pick the male books. They don't pick, when space opera became uh, really popular, it was written by C.J. Cherry and it was written by Lois McMaster Bujold and stuff. Suddenly you started seeing in the, in the magazines like Locus and stuff at the time, um, this is like 1990, you started seeing things like space opera isn't legitimate fiction, fantasy isn't legitimate fiction. It's because women were writing it and it wasn't considered legitimate anymore. Um, so the men had to go play somewhere else. And we're still suffering from some of that. So that was the first half of your question. Now read me the second. Yeah. So, oh, before I read you the second, I just needed to point out two things um, in feedback to what you just said. Um, we had a, a panel session on hor writing horror in the age of Me Too. And Hilary Monaghan uh, pointed out that um, horror seems male dominated because as you said, the gatekeepers keep selecting men's stories. Like apparently there were loads of uh, female horror writers in the 1980s. Oh yeah, I mean, it was dumb. I mean the main yeah. editor of uh, horror fiction in the 1980s was Jean Cavalos. Um, yeah. And she's a woman. Um, she was uh, people who haven't read Kathy Koja, who's now a YA writer, but at the time she was a, a uh, adult horror writer. Nancy Collins, uh, who's now writing comics mostly. But uh, there's a million women writers. It's just you're looking at the wrong lists, people. <laughs> yeah, and Hillary basically said that when when it, it they like you said they're not female author stories aren't reprinted enough, and when you know when people look back and select try, and when editors and uh, publishers look back, select from that era, um, the books that they want to reprint, they inevitably select the male authors. They don't rate the female authors, which is an issue, the gatekeepers. Um, and this, the second uh, point that I was going to make, um, yes, uh, there, there's been conversation about female fantasy authors, debut female fantasy authors, who aren't actually writing young adult, but who just keep getting shut, shuttled off to young adult anyway, because you're female and you're writing fantasy. Again, it's ghetto. I think I, I think I'm using the term correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically just shoving women into a preconceived genre box 
and just leaving us there. That's true, but I don't think that's where the problem is. The problem is in traditional publishing, especially here in the United States. I'm not as familiar as with traditional publishing in places like England and, and places yeah. like that, you know, the overall way of doing it. But here in the United States, traditional publishing is hidebound. It's run by um, white people. Um, there are usually men at the top and women running the rest of it, but it's um, very white. It's very bigoted. It's very structured. For example, um, I'm going to go back to romance because I'm teaching a romance class next week. And so it's right on the tip of my brain. But um, when they started bringing in a lot of African-American writers and Asian-American writers and things like that, instead of putting them in the romance section, they moved them over to the ethnic section of bookstores. And I'm like, why? You know, they're writing romance novels just the same as everybody else. Same with science fiction. They did the same thing. Um, you know, I know of writers now. And I actually had this experience too. The gatekeepers are trying to hang on to their jobs. So they're trying to bring in, right now everybody's talking about hashtag me too. And they're talking about, you know, we need more female voices and we need more voices. For, we need more diversity and we need all this other stuff. So um, when they're buying series from people, um, what they're doing is they're, you know, if they're buying series from a guy, they're saying that's a long time series. Um, they're saying, oh, you should add a woman to it now. And so collaborate with her. Um, and it's like, no, if you want to have authentic female voices, buy books from women. If you want to have a diverse group of books, buy book, you know, have editors, first of all, who understand the communities that you're buying from, and then buy from people who actually are authentically writing it. If you want books by white guys, um, buy the books by white guys because they sell well. You know, just be clear about it. I, I turned down a job just recently of doing a tie-in that was connected to a big movie. Um, and because it turned out that the only reason they wanted me was because I was female. And I was the only woman they'd ever heard of. And I'm like, the have you read? Woman. Yeah, who worked in, in tie-ins. And I'm like, well, A, have you read any of my stuff? And they're like, no. And I'm like, why did you pick me? Oh, because you're the only woman we've ever heard of who worked in tie-ins. And so we figured we'd, we'd work with you. And I thought, I'm not working with you. You're, that's horrible, you know? Go read stuff, figure out who's the best person for the job and then hire that person. And, you know, read a bunch of women because it may not be me, it may be some other woman. There are a lot of women who did tie-ins in the day. So, you know, go look up them. It was really a horrible experience. And, but that's traditional publishing here in the States. They're trying to hang on to their jobs. They're trying to, or as we always say, they're trying to hang on to their phony baloney jobs. Um, but, you know, they're trying to hang on. They're trying to put a Band-Aid on a big problem. And um, right now, you know, they're creating more problems than it's worth. Yeah. My jaw just dropped. There's so many women writing, doing tie-in work now. My jaw yeah. just dropped. Yeah, um, well, that's, I mean, that was how bigoted these guys were. They were just kind of, and I thought, you know how unpleasant it would be to work with them? Every day I would have to be there educating them, and my life is too short. If I was still in my 20s, I would probably do it. Not my 20s. Done that. Yeah. Don't need to do it again. So, anyway, so the second part of the question is, do you think all this pushback that we're seeing that you're coming in, you know, with fantasy with people like, Lynn Flewellen, like yourself, like Steven Erickson. Um, do you think this is a this pushback against toxic masculinity? Do you think it's a, just a trend in science fiction and fantasy, or if it's a bellwether of the changes in society as cultures worldwide start dealing with the damage that male privilege had done to the world, has done to the world, still doing to the world? I love that question. And I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, but here's the thing. Um, I'm 59. I was born in 1960. And I remember reading books in the 1970s that were diverse, filled with a lot of women characters written from the point of view of African Americans with many different cultures. And everybody said, wow, this is going to be different. This is what the, the future is. This is how it looks. And then I don't know what happened. The gatekeepers got back in and they, they, changed it and it was, you know, just all that diversity went away. Uh, probably because, well, I have no idea why. Um, and then it started again in the 90s. And, you know, women were winning tons of awards in science fiction. Women have been a very strong part of mystery for a long time. And the best-selling genre in the United States 
was romance fiction written by women, which everybody knows is junk, right? Because it was written by women. Um, and so, you know, that was growing and changing and, and then it disappeared again. Um, this wasn't just something that happened in publishing. It also happened, for example, in country music, uh, that uh, it, uh, there were a ton of women like Shania Twain and all these women that were on the airwaves in country music in the 90s, and they couldn't get played on the airwaves. It's all male right now on the airwaves in country music, all male, no women. Um, and there's starting to be a pushback against it. So something happened culturally that I don't know, but this is the third time around in my lifetime that we're going, okay, we need to have people of color. We need to have women. We need to have, uh, and now it looks like we've got the problem solved. I don't think we have the problem solved. I don't think it's a bellwether. I think the forces of the other side are pretty strong um, and they push back and it's a back and forth. Um, and I think the minute we think we've won, the minute we think that, okay, we can relax now, we've got women being published, we've got African-Americans being published, we've got some great Asian fiction out there being published, we've got some wonderful Latino, right, Latino writers, Latinx writers, you know, we've got a huge LGBTQ uh, section now, you know, stuff that's going on that's really great fiction. The minute we relax and think we've got it solved, we don't, and something comes back and they push back and it goes away again. So I don't wanna go through this again. I don't wanna see all this stuff disappear again and go back into the, let's redefine and reinvent, you know, the fact that gay people exist, that women exist, that people of color exist. I don't wanna do that. I want literature to reflect who we are as a people instead of reflecting, you know, who the people in publishing are. Hmm. And yeah, we, uh Hopefully there's some traction this time. That's all we can do, right? We can hope and we can work on it and hope that there's traction this time that we are not going to be all put back into the box again for another day for a decade. I think we got to pay attention. I think that's been the problem. You know, we always thought, oh, we've got it solved now. It's done. Yay. Um, no, it's never going to be done. It's a continual journey. And I think we have to just keep an eye and say, you know, we're not going to win. Um, this, we're going to have to keep struggling and we keep struggling every day. And, and, uh, instead of saying, you know, okay, we've got it. You've been educated. You've been enlightened. You've been woke. No, we're going to assume they aren't and keep yeah. pushing. It's the same thing with working to stop violence against women. You know, for every victory that we have, there's always a back, backslide period. Mm -hmm. where to, you know, it's kind of like two steps forward, one step back. You have to, you have to keep going and going and going. And, you know, just one of the things that, you know, I have jokingly say to people is that, you know, my job is done when my organization is no longer needed, when I'm out of a job. And yes. that's not going to happen for a really long time. And it's, it's the same pattern as what you said about publishing and getting you know diverse stories out there and then having a pushback but hopefully hopefully there'll be some traction this time and let's continue talking on about um male uh, about male characters and toxic masculinity to toxic masculinity um your books feature male protagonists like Smokey dalton and miles flint who are fundamentally decent human beings and who always try to do the right thing with violence as the last resort. Do you think reframing how stories describe men away from hostile and toxic stereotypes and towards complexity and even vulner vulnerability can be one of the ways that genre writers can break away from toxic tropes that promote toxic masculinity and the dehumanization of women? Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, you said it. I mean, you said it exactly. Um, we need, I, I said earlier that when I was a young girl in the 70s, I, I had strong female role models in my life, but I also had it in my fiction. Um, if men and young boys have great role models of compassionate, strong men who live a good life and use violence as a last resort, or don't use it at all and use their brains to figure out how to get around it if they have to, um, then, you know, then you end up building a better culture. 
because you can't just work on one side of the culture. You have to work on all sides of the culture. And um, we need to, essentially what we need to learn as human beings is to learn how to be compassionate toward others and to have some kind of empathy for the situations that other people are in. That doesn't give them a pass. There are people out there who um, will take advantage of whatever kind of upbringing they had or you know bad experience and use it as an excuse to live a bad life. But there are a lot of people who had similar experiences and have gone on to become great people. And if you use those people as your role models and your guides, then you learn how to be a better person in this world. And I think that's one of the reasons we're here is to learn how to become better people. Yeah, and you know, there's a whole thing discussion going on now in the violence, anti-violence against women movement where um, we are saying that just because they're traumatized, doesn't give you the right or the license to traumatize other people, to lash out against other people. And and when when you know we hear cases of men going, well, you know, uh, people going, well, you know, he was abused as a kid. But then we like to point out that Archbishop Desmond Tutu watched his, you know, his he grew up in a household where his dad wailed on his mom so often beat his mom up, domestic violence. And yet he grew up, he grew up, he was determined that he will not replicate his father's behavior, that he would stop work tirelessly. And he's done that for more than 80 years. Uh, uh, well, 60 years of his career, if you count from his, when he became an adult, that he worked tirelessly to stop sexism and misogyny and stop violence against women. So in a way, there is a choice. You have to make that choice, whether or not you're gonna- It's not in a way, Um, Mm -hmm. it is a choice. You can go on your life and say, well, that's how my folks did it, and that's how my folks lived. Um, Or you can actually say, you know, it wasn't pleasant growing up in that household. It was scary and it was hard and it hurt. And I don't need to be that same person. Now that, it sounds so easy for me to say that. Um, I grew up in an abusive household. Um, I had a lot of years of therapy. And um, you know, there have been a lot of people who've helped me in my life, but I do remember a choice at one point uh, because I had alcoholic parents. And I remember having, I was going through a really terrible time in my life. And I opened, and I was all by myself. And I opened the fridge door And in there was a bottle of wine. And I thought, you know, I'm here by myself. I could just get drunk. And I thought I'd do that. I'm going down that slippery slope to be just like my parents. And I'm not going to do that. And I closed the fridge door. Um, But, you know, it takes a bit of self-awareness. It takes a little bit of willingness to work on yourself. Not a lot of people are willing to do that. And so, you know, they're looking for excuses. Um, They'll find them. Uh, Nobody gets out of this life without some trauma. So we'll all find some excuse to do whatever we're going to do. Um, But it's better if we kind of step forward and try to be the best people we can. Yeah. And like you said, it's a choice. I mean, we we chatted with Jonathan Mayberry and he came from an abusive household too. And he just, he made a choice. He decided that instead of abusing other people, he was going to try and protect other people. He was going to help other people. And he did. He took self-defense classes and ended up teaching self-defense classes to a lot of women and girls to make sure that they can keep themselves safe. Now, a lot of people will argue that, you know, why, why are we arming women and girls with self-defense and with, you know, things like pepper spray and all that. Uh, but, you know, in, today, in today's world where it's not perfect yet and there's still a lot of violence against women and sexism and misogyny, we have to be, pre- be prepared on all fronts. You need to learn. You need to learn how to survive. Um, That's why these books, The Protector's going to be the first of several, um, are about the women's self-defense movement and um, about learning how to walk through the world with confidence. And that means that there are going to be days when you're going to run into something bad and you're going to need to know how to do it. Now, that doesn't mean responding violently with violence. I'm going to tell you an example just from this morning. I live downtown Las Vegas and I walk every morning. Um, And it was hot this morning, so I was wearing a pair of shorts and a skimpy top, and I was walking along, and a guy flashed me from across the street. Um, Uh And I was like, okay. And he was kind of scary, because there's, um, 
some homelessness in the area and also the jail is nearby and I got a really scary vibe from him. So I've had a lot of self-defense classes. I walked across the street. Hold on, I'm going to cough again. <coughs> Sorry about that today. I, I did not make eye contact with him. Um, instead of going the route I was normally going to go, I walked across the street to a hotel. Um, there were a bunch of valets outside the hotel and I, um, you know, looked at them and because I, I was just had my watch and I thought, you know, somebody's going to get there quicker if I don't call 911, if I actually tell the hotel that there's somebody on their property that's a troublemaker and the security is going to deal with them. So I told the valets and it was a bunch of guys and they didn't care. Um, but they did see the guy and they knew which one he was. And, you know, then I leaned there like that guy. And I'm like, yeah, that guy, I lean over. And then the guy sees me, flashes me again. He throws stuff and the guy's going, yeah, well, that's him. And I'm like, well, that's not satisfying. So I went into the hotel and I spoke to the concierge and I said, Hey, you know, there's this guy out there and he's got, they got security right away. And as I was walking out, um, one of the women who was working behind the desk, she looked at me and she said, are you okay? And I said, I'm fine. Um, I'm going to go out the front door though, because I'm not going to go anywhere near this guy. And she said, good call. And we kept going. And now that was, and I, you know, it was, it was a blip in my day, but I knew how to handle it. I knew don't make eye contact. Don't go anywhere near him. Talk to people immediately, you know, try to get the situation resolved as quickly as possible. Um, and for that particular instance, downtown Las Vegas, it was getting a hotel security person involved when they, they would call the cops and get them there quickly. So, you know, that's um, just basic self-defense is not self-defense is not necessarily using pepper spray and fighting somebody off. Using self-defense is often just making the smart choice as you're going along. And I, I was telling my husband, Dean, about that later today. And he said, well, it's a city. And I said, no, I've run into this kind of thing in the country too, in small towns. Um, and that's scarier because I don't have the backup. I don't have, you know, the, the instant call to the police or the instant, you know, security that I could go get some help from other people. It would have just been me and this guy. And I would have had to use other tricks. That might've been where pepper spray came in. That might've been where in fact, I can run, <laughs> came in. Um, you know, it's different every single situation. And that's what's great about self-defense classes and that sort of thing is they teach you situational awareness and they teach you how to get through each particular instance and in a good way. Yeah. So let's continue talking about genre. Um, the Staunch Prize, which goes to a thriller, uh, quote, in which no woman is beaten, stopped, Actually exploited, raped, and murdered. Okay, uh, you cut out for me. Um, can you oh. repeat that? All right. So the Sponge Prize, which you know, to quote, goes to a thriller in which no woman is beaten, stalked, sexually exploited, raped, or murdered, but launched too much debate uh, about a year ago. And the winner was announced recently, showing that it is possible to write an ex an excellent thriller without violence. So how do you think crime and thriller authors can tackle the issue of violence against women without falling back on harmful stereotypes? Or is the idea behind the staunch prize a better one, that the genre can go without violence against women as a fallback crutch for story? Well, it depends on the kind of story you're trying to tell. Um, and, you know, if you're trying to tell a story that is about violence and, and you know, the aftermath of violence, sometimes you have to write about violence against families, women, that sort of thing. Um, but you can write a great thriller without ever hurting a woman or a child or anybody. Um, you can write all kinds of great stuff without doing any of that. Um, I think it's a failure of the imagination for writers to automatically default to, you know, let's, let's, oh, we need a dead body, it's female. Um, you know, we need uh, somebody over here. Oh, oh yeah, it's a young woman. And, and oh, look, this, uh, it's a young woman who's, this is the thing that really irritates me. Um, there's a lot of, well, let's call it for what it is, you know, the whole Game of Thrones thing. Uh, where uh, strong women only come about because they've been raped and they've learned how to survive it. Um, no, that's not how strong women come about. 
Um, and that happens a lot in fantasy fiction, it happens a lot in thriller fiction. Um, you don't need a woman to go through that kind of trauma in order to become strong and to learn how to lead. Uh, women can be taught just the same way as, as men, um, how to be strong leaders and how to be people who know how to get things done. Um, I think it's a failure of the imagination to say that you need this kind of attitude toward women or your victim is going to be a woman as a default. Um, and I, I think that writers need to think it through, but they also need to think about the stories they're telling. A lot of the stories I'm telling, I'm dealing like in Protectors, I'm dealing with the history of what happened with women and how far we have come, uh, which requires me in some instances to deal with some of the violence against women. So uh, Protectors, for example, would not be a book that would be um, up for that particular prize. Some of the Smokey Dalton books would because what Smokey's dealing with are um, other issues um, in the African-American community and in Chicago of the 60s and, and all of that. So, you know, you can write some really great thrillers. And I've written science fiction thrillers that have never put a woman in jeopardy. Um, and, you know, usually the women are the heroines in my, my stories or they work with the hero. Um, they're not usually the victims. Yeah. And you know, many people in the anti-violence movement say that male violence is the main, if not the root cause of violence against women and girls and of violence in general. Um, how do you think stories and books like yours can help move this conversation forward in a constructive way? I think part of it is to make women real. Um, we need to make them real characters, real human beings, you know, rather than just have one of the the subgenres of mystery that I'm not really fond of, even though I've written a couple of them, uh, usually in short fiction, um, is the body in the library cozy mystery because it is bloodless. Um, and I think crime is a terrible thing. Um, I think crime is one of the worst things that happens to people and it, they live with the aftermath of crime for a very long time. Um, and so, you know, if you trivialize crime and you make it a puzzle and you make it kind of a joke, that kind of offends me. So, um, you know, I want to know, as I said earlier, what happens to people afterward and how they picked themselves up and how they kept going. And if fiction deals with that, which is the theme of protectors actually, is learning how to survive the stuff that's happened to you and keep going and become strong, um, then you're giving people role models, you're giving them solutions, you're giving them places to look to find out things for themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, the more strong women we have, the more strong LGBTQ characters that we have in our fiction, the more strong men who are not relying on their, their, you know, oh, I'm, a, I'm a big strong guy and I, I can solve everything. Um, but they're actually human beings with a heart. Um, the more that they show up in fiction, the better off we're going to be because people find their role models, not just in their lives, but in their fictional lives as well. Yeah, and you know, this reminds me of the conversation that I was having in a urban fantasy group that's quite feminine. And you know, we, we had this thread where I was asking people, you know, name some urban fantasy books and series where the main uh, male character or main male supporting character uh, is a cinnamon role, which is basically a, a cinnamon role is a slang term that came up in the last year or so where. Uh, it describes a character who is essentially good and kind and humane, but suffers a lot of adversity in their lives. Um, and so it took a week for the, the, the discussion to wind down because we all realized that um, a lot of male characters start out as total jerks, total mm -hmm trolling domineering jerks and it's only later in the series that they become cinnamon roll like but then to find a series where the male character starts off as being good kind and a decent person and continues doing that while navigating the all the adversity and all that was more difficult and people were arguing about it going but yeah but he behaves like this later yeah but we're not giving him a pass and not giving him a pass. So we've ended up like maybe having 20 or 30 books and series, and that's not many considering how large the urban fantasy market is. So 
boys need more of those, I think. Boys need more cinema. Boys and books. girls. Boys and yeah. girls. Because, uh, you know, you need, you need to understand there are good people in the world. And, you know, women, you know, need, if they, I have a lot of really great male friends. I have a good husband. Um, I have a lot of good people in my life. Um, and I wouldn't put up with a lot of the behavior that you see from point of view characters in fantasy and science fiction novels that from male point, it, that guy walked into my house or walked, you know, at me or something. I would be like, what is wrong with you? Those are not the people I want in my life. So why are they in my fiction? And, um, you know, I think the more role models we give boys, the more good men that we show girls that men can be, um, the more different way that we can show that people are different cultures and people are different human beings um, and that they can be strong without being nasty, without being mean, without being hurtful, um, the better off we are. And without going through that weird arc you know, mm. that you just described that, you know, they start at the Thomas Covenant basically arc, you know, or yeah. uh, we're not even going to go there, but yeah, yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, we figured out that in the discussion, we figured out that, well, all the women were discussing that thread and we figured out that, you know, uh, the um, Captain America slash Steve Rogers from the MCU, like he is the ultimate cinnamon role. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's, it doesn't make him any less of a man as traditional masculinity would define it. It doesn't make him any less of a person. It doesn't make him any less badass. In fact, it makes him more because he's going up against all that and he's still retaining his ethics and his integrity and the fact that he respects women and girls and, and, and he's good with kids. Mm -hmm. It just makes him a great role model. All he's around. a great, he's a great character. But you'll notice that the MCU started with um, Tony Stark. Yeah, who, right. and his and his arc is exactly the one that you described earlier. Um, mm -hmm. And they had to work from Tony Stark to finally get to Captain America, who is not the same as the Captain America of the early comics. Um, but you know, the character that they have in the MCU is wonderful, and he's a great character, and ooh, he's a nice man, and. That, that causes him problems down the road. And that's okay because nice men have problems, um, especially in a world as toxic as the one we're in right now because they get blamed for the behavior of not so nice men. And they get confused because that's not how they live their lives. Um, and I don't think they should get blamed for it um, any more than I think that you know women should get blamed for the stuff that happens to them or use the stuff that happens to them as an excuse for living a difficult life. Yeah, and and there was another conversation where you're you're talking about you know showing women great role models in fiction, and uh, someone was talking about Dr. Sam Beckett from Quantum Leap, and she said that um, he's the cinnamon roll, and yeah. she said that uh, the reason why she waited so long to get married to find someone to get married was that she had Sam Beckett and her dad. As her role model, she said, there's an absolute minimum I'm going to accept, and that is being a decent human being, treating me well, and treating women and kids well, and being good to other people. And so she held on to that and got married late because she said that it took her that long to find someone who is kind of like Dr. Beckett. And isn't it sad that... Yeah. She had to use that as a minimum rather than say, you know, this is how human beings should be. It's just sad. But she's right about Sam Beckett. Speaking of tie-ins, you know, well, my husband and I wrote a tie-in, a couple of Quantum Leap tie-in novels back in the day um, because we loved the show so much. Yeah, and and I was just re-watching some of the episodes and realizing that uh, the, that series was ahead of its time. No, it was it, part of its time. That's the discussion you and I had earlier. Mm -hmm. um, that was part of the stuff that was going on in the 90s. That was exactly, it, it's not ahead of its time at all. That was the 90s. That was, you know, what was going on. That was the changes that were happening. And then we lost them. And yeah. so it, they weren't ahead of their time at all. That was part of the time. And that show could have aired also in the 70s. Um, not the 80s, not the 2000s, but in the 70s, 90s, and now. Yeah. It makes me sad. It, it is, and uh, episodes, they, um, 
look at rape and sexual assault and victim blaming and domestic violence and and I and maybe I'm I'm a generation behind you, but maybe that's because I I feel like it's ahead of its time because I came I came up through the two thousands and oh yeah. It yeah. was awful. It was awful in the 2000s. It was really awful. It was like, yeah. wait, wait, what happened? How did we slide backwards? Yeah. And um, there's an interesting interview with uh, the guy who plays Sam Beckett. What's his name? Um, Scott Bakula. Scott Bakula. Uh, and he said that actually him and Dean Stockwell were the ones who kept urging Donald Belisario to include themes like that in the series, to, to talk about all these themes, because they felt that it was important and that Dean Stockwell had come of age in the 1960s and 1970s. And he felt very strongly that they needed to address all these issues from racism to sexism to misogyny, violence against women, and the influence shows. It really, mm -hmm. really shows. Yeah, and he was a nice man. I met him a number of times. He was a really nice man. Uh, who, Dean Stockwell? Or yeah, Stockwell? Dean Stockwell. I've never met Scott Bakula, which is probably good for me because <laughs> I, I thought he was awfully cute. But uh, Dean Stockwell was really nice. Yeah. Uh, speaking of quantum leap, let's talk about geek culture. So okay. geek culture in general, including science fiction and fantasy, has had its share of critics critics saying that it's still too male dominated despite a rising number of prominent, well-respected and well-known female creators and authors. Plus there is still plenty of hostile misogynist and sexist behavior by male geeks towards female geeks. We witness the whole cry of, you ruined my childhood at That's Wonder so Woman, at, Mar at Captain Marvel at the gender flipped Ghostbusters. Um, so anyway, so what do you think needs to be done to make geek culture as a whole, whether it's comics or gaming or books or movies, more welcoming for women and girls? Well, first of all, I think we all need to stop paying attention to these people with such tiny, fragile egos. I mean, they ruined your childhood? Excuse me, you don't have to go see that movie. You don't have to go, you, this stuff still exists, the stuff that you liked. So what's your problem, buddy? Um, you know, so first of all, we just stop paying attention and we call them out on their, their silliness and say, hey, um, but uh, you know, I don't think we ever want those people to welcome us. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't want to hang out with people who are that. Um, so we just build our own culture and live in it. And if they wanna alter their attitudes, they can come join us. Um, you know, I don't know why we're paying attention to these whiners. Forgive me. This is where I get blunt. <laughs> they they seem to think that pop culture and geek culture is like pie. That, you know, once all the pieces are gone, they're gone. It's not pie. I keep trying to tell them, tell, you know, I keep going, it's not pie. Right, not but you're, pie. you're engaging with them. I don't know why you should engage with them. Let them live their life. Let them have their little, their little sad you know, my life has been ruined because somebody changed a TV show that I loved when I was a kid. They're not worth your time. Let's, all of us that are living a good life and having fun and enjoying our geek culture, let's just continue enjoying our geek culture and ignore them. They're the whiners in the corner. And if they want to come over and have a good time with the rest of us, they can come on over. Otherwise they can stay in their corner. Yeah, though sometimes they do make it, I mean, the reason why I engage is sometimes they do make it do make life really difficult for female creators and fans. They do. And you know what? You can block them. You can report them. You can tell them to go away. You do, you ignore them. That's what you do with those people. Um, if they get too difficult to be ignored, then you report them to, you know, Twitter or the social media companies. You have, um, you ask them to be blocked. You marginalize them and set them aside rather than giving them a megaphone. That's, yeah. that's my opinion. Yeah. Well, what about conventions? A lot of them are still grappling with, you know, uh, having guidelines for dealing with sexual assault and, and you know, non-consensual touching, especially with cosplayers uh, reporting, female cosplayers reporting a, a lot about stuff like this. What, what would you recommend? 
Well, I'm glad that conventions now have, um, you know, harassment guidelines and all of that stuff. They didn't have it, you know, back in the day, even when I was talking about the 70s and the 90s, they didn't have it. Um, you need to have it. I mean, they had an unwritten rule and there was always women on security. And so they knew what was going on and, and you could report to security. But you had to know somebody to know somebody to know that, which I always thought was wrong. Um, and there were an awful lot of male editors who, you know, sexually preyed on writers, which I found horrifying. Um, and, um, so, you know, that the conventions are taking care of it. They're having guidelines, they're doing that, but it's going to be up to somebody who had somebody touch them inappropriately to report it. You're going to have to say, Hey, you know, this guy groped me on an elevator. You're going to have to be willing. You don't necessarily want to confront him. Um, I would, but that's me. Um, you know, you want to be able to have a place you can report. You want to make sure they know how to do it. You want to have safe spaces. You want to make sure that there is somebody you can talk to. Um, and if there's a problem, then the, the convention itself needs to deal with it. It's not okay for a guy to run his hand down your arm in a, in an elevator guy you've never met. It's not okay for him to whisper in your ear. It's not okay for him to wrap his arms around you, even if he doesn't know you or to tell you, you look sexy. Um, if you're not strong enough to, or that's, that's, that's blaming. And I don't mean to be blaming. Um, what, if you're not able to turn to them in some situations, you may be the only one on the elevator with him and you will, don't want to. Um, but if you want to be, you know, if you're not able to confront them yourself, you need to have somebody who can, you know, you take their name and you take their badge number and you report it. And if they don't do anything about it, like those valets that I discussed this morning, then you go to somebody else and you make sure. And if you keep bringing it up farther and farther, and it's a lot of this behavior that we have tolerated at conventions for years is illegal. It's sexual assault. It's sexual harassment. And so if the the convention doesn't deal with it, then you go to the, you know, where it's being held, the organization that's holding it, you know, like the hotel or whatever, you tell the hotel, if the hotel doesn't deal with it, you call the cops um, and you deal with it that way. Um, and I know that makes your experience unpleasant, um, but your experience was already made unpleasant. And what happens is that conventions are really smart. And if they get a lot of reports about these guys, these guys get banned. Um, and that's what you want. Ultimately, you want this behavior to stop. You want these guys to be, have their name on a list. You want them to be gone. Yeah. And um, I'm just going to also point out that we had we had quite a few Reaper Pixels male authors who say that they make it very clear to all the women that they know and when they're going to conventions that if you need someone to go with you to make the report, if you need someone to back you up, if you are if you are trying to hide from someone who's been groping oh. you, who's been harassing you, you come to us, you come and find us, we'll help you. That is so great. And yes, I know a lot of men who are just like that. A lot of strong women who are really tough and I wouldn't want to find them in an alley. You know, they're, they could beat the crap out of a lot of these, these guys who are harassers um, and they're willing to go with you too. So, you know, there's always safety in numbers. There's always people who can help you. Um, if somebody touches you wrong or somebody talks to you incorrectly, eh, it's not your fault. You need to, you know, just report it, step and, and step aside. The thing is, and the thing I didn't realize when I was young, hang on, I, cause I was making the mistake of thinking I was getting a lot of these people harassing me because I was just outspoken. I didn't realize it was because I was female. <laughs> um, and once I realized it was because I was female, I realized, Oh, this is going to happen to other people. And so you have to report at that point because you don't want, it was horrible for you to go through that experience. So why, you know, not, be quiet about it step up, say something. Chances are the guy who's done this to you isn't going to know you're the one who reported it because he's done it to other women, um, maybe to other young men or other people. And so, you know, whoever you report to, conventions are good about this. Usually the, the authorities are good about this, not always, but they're not supposed to tell who, who said it. So if these guys are serial harassers, they're not going to know who reported it. Um, so you're safe. You can do it. Um, yeah, and that's a really good point because if a guy is harassing you at a convention or anywhere, uh, where any type of convention, not just science fiction or fantasy, chances are they're harassing a whole bunch of people too. So when I was, them, 
Yep. When I yep. was in my twenties, there was an editor and he, he just got fired a few years ago from Tor. Mm -hmm. Actually, he's a really well-known editor. And he came up to me, I was with my husband. We weren't married yet. And we were at a science fiction convention. I was a young writer. I wasn't well known. Um, and he, you know, propositioned me. His wife was just across the hall. Um, and he put his hand on me and he said, you know, hon, I can make sure you're published. And I looked at him and I said, your wife is over there. What the hell are you doing? And he said, well, I just thought you were giving me a vibe. I said, I wasn't giving you any kind of vibe. My boyfriend's over there. Your wife is over there. Go away. And I walked away. I did not report that. I should have reported that. There were a lot of young women that were in the same situation and who gave in to his behavior. That's not who I am as a person. Um, you know, and so I was just, I just thought, oh, he was being creepy to me. I was a young girl. I did not realize that guys like him who are creepy to one girl are creepy to other people as well. And had I reported that, maybe I could have saved a lot of grief from a lot of people. I don't know. It was also, you know, the 80s. Um, I could have reported it and everybody could have gone shrug, not a big deal. That's who he is. Cause I can't tell you how many times I ran into that comment too. It was like, oh, wait, he's, we didn't warn you that he's creepy. Oh, we should have, sorry. Um, and that was the eighties for you, <laughs> but uh, uh, that is the whole boys will be boy. Uh, 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 yeah. No, no, there, there was a really famous sign when I became the editor of fantasy and science fiction, one of the authors who was a columnist for the magazine groped me in the elevator the day I went my, uh, at a nebulous and he was dying. Um, and I, my normal response when somebody gropes me is to elbow them really hard. Cause he was behind me. He was grabbed my ass and I usually hit him with my elbow really hard. And I, just before I did that, I turned around and I saw him standing there and he was laughing. And I thought, oh, great. The first day Chris is, you know, editor of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. She kills a famous science fiction writer. Not a good thing. Um, so I got out of the elevator and instead of confronting the guy directly, I went to my boss, the publisher of the magazine. And I said, the columnist just groped me in the elevator. And he said, oh yeah, we forgot to remind you that he, he, he's kind of creepy. And I said, uh, what? Oh yeah, he's well known for groping women and doing all this stuff and we should have told you. And I said, who else is well known for this crap? Um, and he gave me a list and I'm like, what? I'm supposed to put up with that? And he said, well, you're the editor now, you should put up with it. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to. And if you don't like that, I'm not going to be the editor anymore. And he said, well, we're in for a new era, aren't we? And I'm like, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it was so accepted. It wasn't so much boys will be boys as like there was this list of, you know, guys that were icky and you should avoid them. But if you didn't get the memo, you got groped in the elevator or worse. Um, and I don't think that's right. And I'm glad it's changing. It is. So uh, we got to wrap up soon. And I'm echoing again. Apologies to the audience. Um, so you have been so very incredibly supportive of our Read for Pixels campaign and our anti violence work as a whole. Um, this is a Captain Obvious question, but we ask this of every author that comes on air with us. Why do you support the cause to end violence against women? And what do you think authors can do to help with the cultural change needed to eradicate violence against women? I think the um, cause of eradicating violence against women is a human cause. It's something that will improve society across the board. It is something that will improve the lives of women and children and the men in the world. Um, so any little thing we can do, anything, um, your organization, there are other organizations, there are battered women's shelters there are, that are also accept you know, families. There are rape crisis centers. There's all these things that you can do as a person that will help improve the culture in many ways. And I think if you find out about an organization like, like the Pixel Project, you should support it. Um, and if you have the ability to give money, then give money. Um, if you have the ability to volunteer, then volunteer. Um, as writers, I think we have an obligation to write about the kind of world that we want to live in. Um, sometimes you have to explain the world that we do live in in order to do that. Um, and, but I always think that fiction should offer a little bit of hope. And I think it's really essential. 
for readers to see that little bit of hope. I also think it's essential for readers to see the arc. Um, if a reader is in a really bad situation and they read a story about somebody who's in a really bad situation and gets out of it, that gives them hope. So I think that's part of what we do as writers. We give empathy and we give hope if we're doing our jobs right. Not just entertainment, but a place to escape, a safe place. Yeah, and also I'd just like to add that uh, we one of our programs is called Survivor Stories. And what we do is we invite survivors of any kind of violence against women to uh, fill in a question interview sheet uh, talking about their experience, but more importantly, talking about how they got out of it and how they thrived, they survived and thrived after the experience. And we've done it because we want women and girls out there, other survivors out there to see that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that there is hope, that there are ways of getting out of your situation and that there are people out there who can help, that they're, that they're not alone. I think that's essential. I think it is. I mean, I've been telling some stories here where I've been kind of strong in response to sort of, you know, the, the, the violence that has come against me. But I grew up in an abusive household. And when you grow up in an abusive household, you learn to lay low. So you wait. Um, and sometimes that's the best response, too. Um, you can't report it. You can't get out of it. That's your household. That's what you know. Um, and so you need that hope. You need that thing to say, you know, one day you will survive. One day you will get out. One day somebody will help you. Um, there And find helping people find resources is really important too. You know, so there are the times when I know there are a lot of survivors who feel guilty that they didn't do something more or that what happened to them was their fault. It's not you are a strong person and sometimes being strong is to be quiet and to wait and to find a way out slowly without rocking the water anymore. So you gotta be strong, but you gotta be strong in the way that is best for you and fiction helps. Um, you know, talking to other survivors or listening on the internet to stories from other people, realizing that eventually it does get better. It does. You just have to wait through it. Yeah, and you know, when you need help, when you need to reach out for help, that's when you're ready. When you decide yourself that you're gonna reach out and get help, that's when you're ready. And if anyone here is watching this and you decide that you need help and you want help, um, if you're on Twitter, please go check us out every evening between 8 p.m. to midnight Eastern time, US, uh, uh, USA Eastern time, which is in the morning in Asia and in going into the afternoon in Australasia, uh, we tweet helplines for over 30 countries. So if you need, if you need information, you can get it from there or you can email us at info at project.net and we will go get the information for you and send it to you. So you have someone to call you, a place to start calling to get help in your local area or in your country. Now, we're gonna have to say goodbye soon. So I'm gonna stick myself on the screen again. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us today, Chris, and for the great conversation that we've had about genre and misogyny and toxic masculinity and all of that pop culture violence against women. Um, and um, if you just, if you're, um, Thinking of donating to us, um, Chris has generously has generously provided four has four special giveaways to the stash of author goodies we have up as treats for donors at the Read for Pixels Rally Up fundraising page. And I'm gonna put I'm gonna screen share the little slide that we put together, um, so you can see those see where to get it. There's a link. Chris, can you see this? I can. Okay, so now Chris has two different types of treats. Uh, one is uh, paper books, um, actual hardcover books. Um, this, these are for U.S. donors only. So the first giveaway is the Chris Nell, Nell Scott hardcover book bundle, um, which features one signed and personalized first edition hardcover copy of Protectors, which is the book from which Chris read from 
earlier tonight. And one signed and personalized hardcover copy of Stone Cribs, which is part of the Smoky Dalton series. And uh, the second giveaway uh, is the Kristen Catherine Rush Science Fiction and Fantasy Starter Paperback Book Bundle. Um, that's actually been snapped up by a really generous donor in uh, California. Uh, their name is Yankton Robbins. And the books in there are The Disappeared, which is book one of the Retrieval Art Artist series. Um, and there's one of Diving into the Wreck, which is the book one of the Diving series. And one is The Sacrifice, which is book one of the Face series. Now, the paperback bundle has been snapped up, but if you really want to try Chris's books, we also have an ebook bundle. The ebook bundle goes for a slightly smaller donation request. You can just go on to our um, donation page, our fundraising page to donate to get it. Just scroll down and pick pick that and click donate um, and uh, whip out your credit card. Um, and we also have a, a ebook bundle version of the Chris Nelscott bundle, which is an ebook edition of Protectors and an ebook edition of Stone Crips. Now, a, a really important note here is that unlike Amazon and Google Play and Apple Books, um, the, you will own the files of these books. Donate to us and Chris will actually send you the file. You will have the book forever and ever. You won't need to worry about, oh no, it's been taken off Amazon Kindle. I don't have that book anymore. No, you will keep that book forever and ever. And uh, we have raised so far towards a $5,000 goal. We have raised $755. It's a little slow at the moment. It's mid-September. So if you can give something, please do. We need. Uh, we will use the funds towards uh, keeping our programs such as this one and our initiatives such as the Survivor Stories campaign um, running through the years because these are annual campaigns. They are going on and on and on because we need to educate folks, we need to raise awareness, we need to provide resources to teachers, parents, coaches, librarians, everybody who wants to make a change in their community and need tools for it. Um, and also, um, if you're not into Chris's books or if Chris's books have all flown off, have all been taken up, um, there are plenty more author goodies um, from other authors, including Alison Goodman, Hilary Monaghan, Alma Alexander, and Sarah Langan. Plus, this week is Epic Fantasy Week. So if you like, you know, sword and sorcery and dragons and, um, you know, Game of Thrones, like grimdark stories, um, some of the best epic fantasy authors writing today have donated stuff. Uh, they have stuff available to send to donors. Most of them will send worldwide. I'm going to say this now. Uh, this is the first uh, first fundraiser where a lot of the, uh, more than half of the authors have said that they would send the books that they're signing personalizing worldwide. So these authors include Adrian Tchaikovsky, Juliet E. McKenna, Jen Williams, Anna Smith Spark, James A. Moore, and Richard K. Morgan. And there are also books from Bradley P. Bolio. Those are for US donors only. Um, and you can go to bit.ly slash R4P Rally Up 2019. That's for most of the goodies. It's um, just go there, scroll down, pick the goodie you want, make the donation request, fulfill the donation request, and the goodies will be on their way to you. Um, or you can bid on Stephen Graham Jones's first edition books. Now, Stephen Graham Jones is one of horror's uh, one of horror's luminaries. So, if you like really, really great and inventive horror, because Stephen writes a lot of different books, a lot of horror mashed up with different genres. Always interesting, always a great read. Go to bit.ly slash SGJ charity auction 2019. That auction ends on September 21st unless we extend it. So go and get your bits in right now. Um, and if you want to find out more about the Read for Pixels program, you can go to bit.ly slash read for pixels. Um, and you, if you want to find out more about Violet Speaks Women and what to do about it, you can go to our website at www.thepixelproject.net. There are lots of resources there, what uh, pages where 
uh, introductory pages to different forms of violence against women from domestic violence all the way to murdered and missing indigenous women which is a huge issue it's being classified as a genocide in canada so if you want to learn more about that look up videos look up studies look at u.n reports it's all there on our website so chris do you have any announcements you want to make any anything coming up in the final quarter of the year that you would like to tell everyone about I have a new diving novel that is coming out on Tuesday. It's called The Renegade, um, and it's set in the past of the diving universe. So, you know, I had to explain something to myself. I write into the dark, and I ended up writing an entire book to explain something to myself. So it's a good book if you want to use it as an introduction to the diving universe because you don't have to know all the characters and everything else. You can just start cold on that one. Okay. So uh, when is that coming out? Exactly. On Tuesday. On Tuesday. Okay, so it's Tuesday. It would be Tuesday, uh, 17? Tuesday yep. 17th? Yep, September 17th. Right. So, uh, guys, go check it out. You can go to Chris's uh, website at www.chriswrites.com. Did I get that right? Yep, and it's K-R-I-S. Chris yeah, Writes, Kat. yeah. Because some Chris people spell that with an unnecessary H. So, um. <laughs> really? That's, that's weird. I've, it would... Doesn't make sense because K H R. No, it's C H R, and uh, that's not me. It's an unnecessary yeah. H. Yeah, and Chris also has her blog is her blog is legendary for advice and insights into publishing and writing. So go check out her blog there too. So I think we need to wrap up now. So Chris and I will say good. Good day or good night wherever you are in the world. And um, our to if you are interested in epic fantasy and horror, tomorrow at 8:30 p.m. Eastern time, we have James A. Moore coming on board to talk about violence against women and uh, sexism, sexism, gender, and misogyny in his books and in a geek culture. Um, and James is battling cancer right now, but he is still determined to do this. So. If you can turn up, please do to um, give him some support. So um, Chris and I will say bye now. Um, anything else? You Any last words, Chris? No, except thank you guys for doing this and for doing the good work. I'm, I'm, I hope you people out there who are listening, I hope you, um, you know, donate and support. And if you can't afford to donate, um, just send the links and share this so that people can find the Pixel Project and give money to the, uh, the fundraiser. All right, so good night, everyone. Good night.